Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast. I am your host, Rob Port. Two interviews today, so not much of a rant to start the podcast. I will apologize for missing yesterday's episode. Uh, I had a little bit of a technical difficulty when it came time to uh, uh, interview Senator Kramer. I- I'll be honest with you, my internet went down for a little while. We were having a lot of wind where I live, and uh, my internet went down for a while, and that was the uh, window of opportunity when I could interview Senator Kramer. So uh, we ended up with no episode tomorrow. Hey, it happens. Uh, but today we have an interview with Congressman Kelly Armstrong. He answers some of your questions. Remember, uh, he's on. Uh, a, I interview him every Thursday. It publishes every Friday. You can send your questions in for him to Rob at SayAnythingBlog.com or follow my social media feeds. I solicit questions as well. Uh, the other person I interview is a uh, is a state uh, Democratic lawmaker from the Grand Forks er- uh, area. Uh, his name is uh, my, Matt Eadson, uh, and he, well, it's kind of unusual. He's now working as a journalist in state media. He's working for the Grand Forks Herald, which is uh, owned by the company that I work for, Forum Communications Company, and also uh, is working for Prairie Public, and he's a Democratic state lawmaker, and that's unusual. I mean, we live in an era of fake news. We live in an era where a lot of people feel uh, the media has a, has a definite uh, ideological slant to it. Um, a lot of people from my perspective, the conservative side of things feel like, uh, the, the press has a, has kind of a, a left leaning slant. And here's a Democratic lawmaker working for the press as a, a straight news reporter. It's kind of interesting. Uh, well, you talk with him about that and explain how he's gonna, uh, he's gonna address some of the obstacles with that. I'll be honest with you. I don't, I don't think that those are compatible jobs. I don't think that a person can be, an elected official and a journalist and do all the things you need to do to do a good job in both arenas. But you'll hear Matt explain how he's going to try to accomplish that. Uh, Both interviews coming up straight ahead right after this. This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota. Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. Matt Eadson joins me now. He is a Democratic state lawmaker from the Grand Forks area and more, most recently a working journalist, which is, is a little bit interesting. Uh, he is working with Prairie Public News, which is a uh, public news uh, organization covering uh, North Dakota, our region. Uh, and he's also working now for the Grand Forks Herald. Now, of course, the Grand Forks Herald is part of Forum Communications, which is also the company that I work for. So, uh, Matt, I guess we are colleagues, uh, co-workers. We work together. Uh, but a lot of people are kind of raising eyebrows because you are also, you're, you hold elected office and now, you're going to be working in in journalism, and I, I think a lot of people are kind of scratching their heads at that. And I, I wanted to have you on just just to to talk about it. Certainly, and and I can certainly understand the um, uh, a lot of the trepidation that some people might have uh, when it comes to me being a journalist, but then also being a sitting lawmaker. Uh, I think one of the most important things to remember is that this is just a temporary thing. Uh, it's for this summer. Uh, my internship with Prairie Public will end right around the time that I start my master's in the fall. And then uh, so far as the Grand Forks Herald, uh, I don't have a clear cut timeline on how long I'll be writing for them. Uh, I know they've been searching for new writers to take over a lot of the beats because there's a lot of reporters that are leaving. So since I have um, worked for them in the past, they're just kind of bringing me on to help out for the time being. And I've had several conversations with uh, the editor of the Herald to make sure that, you know, anything where there might be any sort of conflict or uh, conflict of interest or any sort of issue, um, you know, I know where that line is, so I know to back out and uh, hand it over to another reporter if it comes to that. How how do you define a conflict of interest? Because I mean, I mean, obviously, you you work for the legislature. The legislature makes the laws for the whole state. Uh, you know, they they appropriate money for the whole state. As a matter of fact, Prairie Public Broadcasting, Prairie, Prairie Public receives an appropriation from the legislature, and then also. Uh, you know, for instance, I know I, I was reading in the article that you might be doing some coverage at the University of North Dakota. Obviously, 
that's a state institution. Uh, the legislature makes policy for the universities. The legislature makes appropriations for the universities. So I, I guess knowing all that, I mean, those all seem to be a little bit of a con. There must be some sort of a sliding scale for conflicts of interest. Uh, how does that how does that work? What constitutes a conflict of the sort that you would then refrain from covering the story? Certainly, and and I can understand that. I think uh, one of the ways in which we're trying to mitigate any sort of issue or conflict that might come up in the future is making sure that the beats that I cover are hyper-focused. And as you mentioned, there are possible conflicts with uh, covering the university or with covering local politics here in um, Grand Forks, which is one of the things I'll be doing, as well as covering the base right outside of Grand Forks. Um, a lot of those, uh, just avoiding the conflict is just, you know, doing the work of a journalist and being middle of the road and keeping in mind whatever bias that I may or may not bring to the table. And, you know, I would argue that any journalist has to worry about that kind of thing. Yeah. Any journalist has ways that they feel about a particular issue, and they just have to be mindful of that. So when they write that article or they, you know, make that, uh, made that segment for radio, they have to make sure that it doesn't, uh, that nothing that they believe personally comes through on that article. And, um, you know, I think, I think a lot of journalists have the, um, uh, have the advantage where they can be private about that kind of thing. They don't have to let people know that, Oh, I'm yeah. a Democrat or I'm a Republican or, you, you know, do, whatever though. the case may I mean, be. You, you do. I mean, that's public record. You have a voting record exactly. at the legislature. I mean, that's, there's just no avoiding it. And, and I'll be honest with you. I have been an advocate in the past. No, I don't, nobody's unbiased. We're all, we're all biased. Mm-hmm. We're all looking at the world. We, we try to be fair. Uh, but nobody's without bias because we all have our life experiences that have shaped us, that have shaped how we view the world. It's just the way it is. Uh, nobody's sure. perfect. And so in a lot of ways, I've, I've long argued that reporters ought to stop pretending that they're biased and stop hiding their biases and just put them out there and then report fairly anyway. Uh, I agree with that. But to me, that it's even a different thing than being a member of elected office. Now, what I do is different than what you do. I'm I'm a commentator. I don't think there's usually any. I don't leave a lot of ambiguity ambiguity about where I <laughs> right. where I come down on an issue. So, you know, nobody knows where. I, but I would I would never try to do my job, even even considering that I I have more latitude to be biased than than you would as a, a, a straight news reporter. I would never hold elected office and and work this job at the same time. I don't think it would be possible. Uh, I I don't I I just I don't see how that would work. And I'm wondering, like I mean, we've been talking about the reporter side, but what about what about the other side? I mean, you work for a news organization. If you're in a room, a, a Democratic Party meeting, or what have you, and you learn about something that's that's newsworthy, how do you function? I mean, how do you how do you split the difference? I mean, if if you're sitting in a a room full of Democratic uh, party organizers or politicians and you hear something that's newsworthy, do you just, do you just sit on it then? I mean, which, which. Yeah. Sure. Uh, sorry to cut you off. Um, no, I think when it comes to that, uh, and I've had this conversation before, this is, uh, this is just a case of making sure that I create a very clear line of separation between when I'm in, uh, when I'm doing work as a journalist and then when I'm doing work as a legislator. So if I were, uh, if I were conducting business uh, as a legislator, so if I were in a forum or whatever the case may be, everything from that point on, I am a legislator. I am not there to uh, learn anything new to write about. I'm not there to do any journalistic coverage in any way, shape, or form. Just as if I were covering something as a journalist, uh, again, I wouldn't bring anything anything that I've learned from the legislator or any knowledge, anything like that, into the interview room. And, and, you know, specifically with uh, covering city politics in the future, um, I have wondered if there would be an instance where somebody would bring up some legislation that was passed during session. And I've said that several times what would happen is if that did happen and if somebody did ask me a question related to uh, legislation that was passed, I would very clearly tell them, listen, if you want to talk about that, we can absolutely do that later. But right now I'm a journalist and everything that you are saying to me is on the record, and I would like to keep it focused on the subject matter at hand. So I really think just the most important thing is making sure there's very clear separation, not just in my mind and the way I conduct myself, but with the people that I'm also speaking with at the time. Yeah, because I and, and again, I and I guess I'm using it because I, I work in the same industry, and again, I'm I'm not a straight news reporter. I'm a commentator, but I I just. Because I talk with people all the time, and I have off-the-record conversations sometimes. I have on-the-record 
conversations. But my job at the end of the day is to reveal things for the public. And and again, I'm a commentator. I'm but but I mean that's that's my job going in. And so I don't know how I would be able to separate that if I was in the legislature and I was I was, you know, in the committee hearings, if I was having conversations with my caucus, if I was strategizing, you know, to you know, politically strategizing and then turn around and, and try to write about the legislative process or the government process or whatever. I just I don't see how you reconcile those things, Matt. And and again, I, I realize that this is this is a short term thing. I mean, you said that it's it's an internship. It's just for for the summer. But uh, you know, I I just I'm, it's going to be interesting to watch how you reconcile those two things because I, I would think that either either you're not going to be able to do your full job as a news reporter and report all of the things that that, that you know and that you're aware of and and pursue all those stories or you're going to be isolated on the political side because nobody's going to want to have a candid conversation with the reporter in the room yeah and you know and you are right it is it is difficult terrain to go through it's a, it's a difficult thing to navigate but i think my mindset and not like where i'm sitting at right now and then also where my editors are sitting at and that is is the best place to start. And that is just being as transparent as entirely possible about this whole process. And if I ever get in a situation where I am questioning something to make sure that I bring it up to people with a higher pay grade than me and make sure that we have that discussion and try to figure out what is the best decision from that point on, because, you know, you're right. There are, there is going to be some overlap and I'm going to have to address that. And uh, again, I think the brevity of this, of this position of these two positions will definitely help with that. But, and also avoiding anything to do with uh, statewide politics and trying to keep it local and just the university. Um, but either way, I do understand there will be some overlap. And, you know, as we go through there, if I get into a situation where I think that I need to back out of this or this is something that uh, I shouldn't be covering or maybe I need to cover it in a different way, then that's the point in time that I don't keep it to myself. I take it to my editor. I'm fully transparent about it. And whether it's assigning a different journalist to the story at that time, or maybe including something in the article about the fact that I'm a legislator. Or if, yeah. if it comes to that, you know, those are decisions that uh, I'll have to make with my editor. Uh, last, last question. I, um, from, from the conservative perspective, and obviously I'm, I'm right of center. So, so from the conservative perspective, our complaint is that there's not a lot of the news pe- people in news media who are right of center. Um, right. you know, especially in the social media age. I mean, we can see, you know, the, the, the reporters on Facebook, on Twitter or what have you, and you know, what, what their feelings are, their ability to, to hide some of those biases is, has evaporated very quickly. And you look across the news media right. and it's overwhelmingly Democrat. Well, we also live in an era with fake news. And I don't, I don't like a lot of what president Trump has said about the news media, calling them the enemy of the enemy of the people. I think that's wrong, but I think he has been able, with his fake news mantra, has been able to tap into some very deep-seated feelings that the public has in terms of trusting the news media. And so in that context where people see the news media sort of leaning to the left and have have diminished trust in the news media, here we, we find out that two very prominent, two of the most important media outlets in our state, Prairie Public and and the Grand Forks Herald. By the way, I'm a daily Prairie Public listener. I listen to it waking up every morning. Don't tell my conservative friends that I listen to public radio, <laughs> but uh, I do every morning. I I love the content. Uh, but it's a uh, you know I I mean these are two very prominent media outlets that have literally hired a partisan elected official to work for them. I I, I think in this age, I, I think there's going a lot of people out there who are going to be saying, well, this just proves what we've been saying all along. It's liberal media. And, and I can certainly understand that sentiment. I would argue the fact that my political affiliation, so a lot of that, uh, a lot of what you just spoke about, you know, uh, liberal media or fake news, whatever the case may be, that is something that sometimes, sometimes it's uh, more apparent, but sometimes it's just people and their perceptions sure. with how, what they're, with what they're reading. Oh, yeah. Now, I think one advantage that I can bring to the table is that you know, you know where I'm coming from. And more, and I would argue more importantly, I know where I'm coming from. I'm very aware of the fact that I am a Democrat and that I am a sitting legislator. So that is something that I'm going to keep in mind every single time I write an article. When I sit down to write something, every single word, every single paragraph that I have, I'm going to have to think, okay, are people going to think that I'm being too fair to the left or they think I'm being too fair to the right? Like, what are people going to think of what I'm writing? And if I have to go through an editing process to make sure I'm absolutely middle of the road, that's something I'll do. And that's something that, 
you know, just the attention that me getting, honestly, an internship that's for the summer and a freelancing gig that's likely just for the summer, just the attention that that in itself has gone has already gotten me on a point where I'm like, okay, I need to be hyper aware of everything that I do and make sure that I do this entirely by the book. And if I am in a position where I feel like I need to back out or I'm uncomfortable about something I'm covering, then it's something that I'm going to deal with with my editor and I'm going to back yeah. out and I'm going to do the right thing. I think your, I think your intent is, is pure, Matt. And I, I don't, I just don't, I don't see the job as an elected official and a job as a member of the press. I don't think that those are two hats that you can wear at the same time. I, I don't really think that you can reconcile and do the best possible job at both of them because they're just, in a lot of ways, they just have contradictory interests. I, I, I would, I would, I don't know, I don't know that anybody can do that. I, I know that we've had, we, we have had members of the, of, the news media in the legislature before I'm thinking of a longtime Republican state Senator, John Andrus, who was a newspaper publisher. In fact, yep. is in the North Dakota newspaper hall of fame, uh, as just one example, Bill Devlin is, uh, currently in the, uh, in the legislature representative Devlin is in, you know, works in the, the newspaper industry, but they weren't, they also weren't beat reporters. You know, I mean, they were publishers and maybe, I don't know if that's a distinction without a difference. It's just, I don't know. It's uh, it's certainly interesting. What are your long term plans? I mean, obviously you're you're an internship here. If, if you obviously have aspirations for the news media, or, is that where you're thinking long term? Your your career path wise. Uh, so journalism is something that I've been interested in my whole life. Uh, you know, down to high school, I did. Uh, I was in. I was part of my uh, high school paper. And then even whenever I got out of or uh, whenever I got out of high school, I originally planned to go to college right away and become a journalist, but. Uh, I ended up joining the Marine Corps for about eight years and then getting out. And at that point, I decided to pursue the dream now. Um, now that I am elected, obviously, I'm going to have to make uh, that decision going long term. Uh, I haven't made any decisions with that right now. Um, I immensely enjoy my work that I get to do with uh, uh, during session. And as a legislator, I enjoy working with everybody. Uh, but at the same time, I have a deep respect for what journalists do. And I have a deep respect for that profession. And you know, here in a few years, I'm going to have to make that decision. Um, right now, I, I can't say that I have done that, but it's definitely something that's on my mind. Well, Matt, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota. Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. Congressman Kelly Armstrong joins me as he does every week to take your questions. If you want to submit your questions, remember you can send them to rob at sayanythingblog.com. You can also submit them via social media. If you're following me on Facebook or Twitter or following Say Anything Blog on Facebook or Twitter, uh, I put up threads every week soliciting questions so you can submit your questions that way. Kelly, how the heck are you doing? I'm doing great. I finally, I've been in committees for the last two days so i made it back to my office for a little bit and now i'm talking to you and the good people in north dakota so it's pretty good well that's good uh, speaking about being in committees uh yesterday uh you had some questions for democratic witnesses at a, a meeting of the house uh, judiciary committee uh, testifying on uh, they're talking about the the subpoena that committee democrats had issued to Ger attorney general barr um and, and your questions to them and, and you essentially got these these democratic witnesses again these are these are people that the democrats themselves called to testify before this committee you got them to agree with you that that the subpoena democrats have issued and that democrats are holding attorney general Barr in in contempt for would have required him to break the law i i mean it, I, I thought it was kind of interesting because it seems like we took this what's what's a very complex issue that, that I think a lot of Americans are having a hard time sometimes tracking because there's so much being said about it and everything else. But you took it and you narrowed it down to a very narrow thing and said, listen, if, if he had if he had followed the subpoena as it was issued to him, he would have had to break the law. Kind of an interesting moment. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it, 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 it really was. And I, I want to be these were good witnesses. I mean, ideologically, I don't agree necessarily with them. I mean, they're no friends of the president or the administration in some ways. 
But this was a good hearing about executive privilege and its history and where it applies and where it doesn't. The problem is this hearing was held after they held a contempt order on Barr. And I think it is a I, I, I mean, I think it's a huge deal that um, three law professors called by Democrats to testify on executive privilege said on the record in a, in a, in a congressional hearing that in order to comply with the subpoena, Attorney General Barr would have had to violate federal law. I, and I think it matters more than in the moment, because when this ends up in court, that's going to be a big I mean, it's a pretty good defense to anything to say, hey, judge, I'm sorry. I didn't. I'm sorry. I'm held in contempt, but it, I, I couldn't break the law. <laughs> now, one of the one of the experts argue, because by the way, there's video of this. I'm sure you can find it all over social media. I posted it. Say anything blog dot com if you want to check it out. But during it, one of the witnesses kind of came back at you a little bit. And said, yep. "Well, Attorney General Barr could have he could have gone and asked a judge to uh, to basically allow the grand jury testimony to be made public or, or to be divulged, I guess, uh, in compliance yep. with the subpoena." And and your response was was essentially, "Well, you, but but the subpoena can't compel AG Barr to go to court." I think a lot of people in the public may may have heard that exchange and thought, "Well, that's just." legal niceties if there's a way to just put all this out in the public why not ask a judge i mean why yeah. explain that for yeah, me yeah you know who bit. else can go ask a judge who else you know who else can go ask a judge the chairman of the judiciary committee the, the legislative branch cannot compel the executive branch to do something through a subpoena i mean that is bar's authority to do it if he chooses to go to court he sure can but the other answer is is they don't need a the reason they want attorney bar attorney general bar to go to court with them is because about a month ago, there's a case out of the D.C. Circuit regarding grand jury testimony, um, and there's no guarantee that the there's no guarantee that the court would say release the grand jury testimony. There's a pretty narrow. They really narrowed the exceptions as to when um, grand jury testimony can be released. Do you know where else they can release it? Is if they started impeachment proceedings because impre- impeachment proceedings are considered quasi judicial which is actually one of the exceptions to grand jury testimony. But they won't do that because they know that an impeachment proceeding is not what the American people want, but they have to have these pseudo impeachment proceedings to keep their base happy. And outside of all the political noise revolving the Mueller report and Barr and all of this, I think it's incumbent on all of us to recognize that you cannot hold an attorney general in contempt for not violating the law. Now, just so we're, we're full circle back to just I, I think where we always end up when we talk about this, which is that this all just seems to be for show. Like there does I, a lot of times these committees, when they do investigations, they're sort of fact finding, truth finding missions. This just seems to be about generating headlines. Absolutely. I mean, when when, when uh, Attorney General Holder went through this process and they eventually held him in uh, in contempt prior to that, there were significant negotiations between the executive branch and the legislative branch and various different things were released and, and withheld over the course of like five months. And uh, in fairness to Attorney General Holder, he did release a lot of documents, but he didn't release all of them. And so after those negotiations finally broke down after a period of five months, that's when the, that's when the Congress held him in contempt. This all happened in a span of like days. <laughs> This was never about real negotiation and accommodation. This was about a headline. Let's uh, let's move on and talk about something else, which is a lot in the headlines now, which is uh, basically China. Uh, we talked about this a little bit last week, and just I, I will admit, I, I was we were talking about China, and it just kind of came to, and I ended up writing a, a longer blog post about it at sayanythingblog dot com. Uh, the headline is uh, what if what if the issue? I'm paraphrasing here. I can't remember my own headline, uh, but it basically, you know, what what if the issue with China is bigger than soybeans? And my my point was, and I, it started with our conversation last week, and then I kind of fleshed it out for a blog post. But this this increasingly has because we we spent so much time talking about the trade war with china in terms of its immediate economic impacts on the united states and in our region that's you know soybeans i think has kind of become the 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 symbolic uh talking i, I want to call it a talking point cuz i don't want to be dismissive of it it's important but uh so, sort of the symbolic issue with the trade war with china soybean farmers are being denied a very large market because president trump is taking it to china on this and and my my larger question and is, you know, what if what if trading with China, our assumptions that we've made about trade with China going all the way back to the Clinton administration, when we first started bringing 
China into the fold in, in the global economy. We gave them most favored status. We moved them up to full, you know, full normal trade status. Uh, you know, we, we did all of these things. And, and yet, you know, the, the assumption was by doing these things, we were going to get China to reform some of their, you know, civil rights abuses. We're going to make them better global neighbors, essentially. And I'm not sure that it's worked. I mean, you look at China today, they're an enormous threat to us on multiple fronts. They're an enormous threat to their own people. They've got millions of people in concentration camps. What if our stated goals in trading with China as an authoritarian communist regime isn't working? And what if maybe we don't, we shouldn't be trading with China anymore? Well, I, 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 there's a lot to decouple there. And I, know. I, I mean, I think, I, I think the, I mean, I think the article is, I mean, accurate in that I will say that there is no bigger strategic threat to the United States, either economically or militarily, particularly when we go into 5G and where we're going to get into different areas than China. And there has not been, I, I, I mean, it, and it was a laudable goal, all partisanship aside. I mean, that has worked when we have done that with other countries. Oh, it has. We have developed, we have developed democracies. Um, so I applaud the Clinton administration. Sure. For, oh, uh, and it uh, had approaching it. Yeah, it, and it was not a but partisan. Agree, it was not a partisan issue even in its yeah. day. Plenty of Republicans yeah. agreed with with President Clinton. In fact, I have spent years justifying our trade with China and other regimes on that very basis. If we if we have economic ties with them, if we have a trade relationship for them, that makes everything else easier with them normally but what i'm worried about is that our trade with them has become sort of a fuel cell to make china richer and 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 to help china reform in pursuit of the same ugly things that they've always pursued yeah and i and I, where i will where i will um push back well i'll push back on you a little bit on the on the egg commodities and how we do with tariffs and the reason is, is I, I, I applaud President Trump for taking this on because I think it's I think it's truly an important issue. I think the concern is, is that this escalating tariffs, escalating trade wars, a little bit of this go it alone, your your um, society, or go it alone strategy is not it may be effective in its outcome or it may last to a point where it's so long that it's no longer effective. Especially considering, I mean, we are going to be involved in trade with China. I mean, we are going to, we're going to moving forward. Um, we need to get better at it. We need to get better at their thefts of uh, intellectual property. We need to have serious conversations about what they're building up for sa- for satellites in space, uh, their military, and more importantly, how they are making inroads in a lot of developing nations across uh, across the world. When we sh- shrink from the world in commerce, it never usually ends up well for us. We've done it three or four times in the history of this country and it's always evolved into a mistake rather than something else um that being i mean that being said we also have to recognize that one of the things that is true with the u.s economy throughout history is when a country suffers the rest of the economy suffers pretty quickly after that and i mean politics is politics we i mean it's it's great that the president is doing these things but we got to protect um, the economies in North Dakota, particularly the ag economies, because otherwise, otherwise, long term, long term, long term solutions don't solve short term bankruptcy. Yeah, well, and but that's that's the balance, right? I mean, there's the rub. We have the politics of the moment where real people can be heard about this. But then we also have the larger long term question of what's our relationship with China is going to be. I, I don't know that there's any simple answers. And I'm I'm, I'm not disputing President Trump's, uh, you know, approach to this. I'm not. I'm not saying that, that that soybean farmers should just suck it up either. I'm just saying there's another facet to this that I'm not sure is getting as much attention perhaps as it, as it should. Uh, I, yeah, I want, the oversimplification sorry. of that, Rob, outside of all the other stuff, is China's on the moon because they're good at theft, not because they're good at technology. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and that, I mean, and, and as we continue to deal with this, and the other answer is from a society like ours. I mean, we'll pay 800 as consumers, we'll pay $800 for a cell phone, but we won't if we can get it for 720 and $720. And I mean, and, and this affects the job economies. I mean, I mean, all of these things, it's one of the reasons why you, why I argue against the national minimum wage is because all you do is offshore, end up offshoring those types of jobs. And a lot of those go to China. It also goes into the climate change debate because they control 90 percent of the rare earth metal market, which is where we need all of these materials to build batteries for storage for wind or solar or electric cars. So it's a huge strategic 
Um, they're a huge strategic threat to us in, in just about every area of the economy. We just need to do it in a way that doesn't completely bankrupt farm country in the process. I, uh, I want to, while we're on this topic, I want to ask you very quickly about a press release the North Dakota Democratic Party put out this week, uh, dated May 15th. Uh, the headline is, hello, Congressman Armstrong. And, and they're hitting you because they're saying that there was no uh, statement on your website, that your social media is lively, but you haven't really said anything about the trade war or, or the collapse and negotiations between the Trump administration and China. This is their statement. Uh, I quote, when you are the only congressman for a state like North Dakota, you have to understand agribusiness. And when your constituents are putting their livelihoods on the line, you cannot remain silent. You just can't, said Allison Jones, communications director for the Democratic uh, Party. North Dakotans at least deserve to know if Congressman Armstrong will stand up to the administration or will blindly cheer for reckless strategies that continue to devastate North Dakota's agriculture economy. They deserve better than Kelly Armstrong's silence. I know you haven't been silenced them because just, just last week, uh, uh, you commented on your position on this issue relative to the Trump administration's position. So it's not like you haven't been silent, but they're saying you haven't been doing enough to communicate this. Um, ha- have you been avoiding this issue on your social media? Uh, no, I've been dealing with the social media the way I do it. I did three egg country interviews, radio interviews in the last 48 hours. If anybody calls from press, I mean, you know this about me. If anybody yeah. calls and wants to know my position on anything, we'll give, I mean, we'll put it out there. I mean, it's, <laughs> we don't do press releases because quite frankly, there's only about 15 people in the entire state that read press releases. Oh. I've, I've been involved in North Dakota politics I'm, I'm for one a of very them. long time. I'm one of them, but yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I mean, if, if, if anybody wants to know my position, I, you'll be hard to find, but I'd find a radio guy or a newspaper guy or a TV guy or a girl in North Dakota that I don't respond to when I get asked for a comment. Uh, and it's, it, it's we we're running we're running three committees deep and working our tails off down here to try and represent North Dakota in the areas where we're doing it and we'll continue to do that. A uh, question from a listener: Dwayne asks, "Is the national popular vote movement, which is a threat to a small population like North Dakota, going to be successful in going around the Constitution?" Well, the I think what he's referring to is all these state legislatures that are passing um, essentially laws that say their their electoral votes will go to whoever wins the national vote. And I haven't looked into the law enough. I mean, this is pretty, I mean, pretty interesting area. I think it's a novel approach. Um, there's still quite a few states away from getting there, but I think it's something that should cause any rural community pause for concern because what you'll end up seeing happen and it'll be particularly Democrats right now, but it doesn't always have to be right. I mean, the one thing about politics is it's always changing, but they'll be running up their stats in New York City and San Francisco and areas um, where they can do it. They're closer. They're more condensed. It's easier. It's more cost effective to do it that way. And it'll really leave producing states in the lurch. And, I, and that's not Republican states or Democratic states. It's producing it's producing districts versus consuming districts. And it's even more scary than that, because if that would ever become real, I mean, a a real thing, you're anywhere from six to 10 years away from having policy that is not just detrimental to uh, producing states. It'll be detrimental to the whole country, because when you're only when you're only catering to the consumers, you are going to cause significant problems with the producers. And then 10 years later, when your producers have problems, your consumers are going to have a lot of problems. Uh, this is this great experience experiment that is a democratic republic is set up pretty pretty good right now and i also think it's the big difference between democrats and republicans you know when romney lost his election of republicans as we looked back and said you know it might have been a mistake to run the one republican who couldn't run against obamacare since um i mean he had instituted it as government of massachusetts and we need to do better and listen to our listen to our our constituents about who they want to see as candidates and when democrats lose an election they just want to change the rules well i i think there's truth in that it also i mean a lot of what you're talking about is part of why i, I have been a little skeptical of the Republican move towards populism with the rise of Donald Trump, just because populism a lot of times is just about sort of whatever's popular on a mass scale. And I I feel like government and politics should be more nuanced than that. I mean, we, we have disseminated even within our state disseminated the power to govern widely and, 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 and not necessarily along the lines where it's just majority rules all the time. 
I, in fact, I think we put a lot of place of protections to make sure that the majority doesn't rule and we don't have a tyranny of the majority and we're protecting minority interests and minority points of view in, in every in every sense of the term that minority is racial minorities, unpopular speech, uh, you know, p- people like, like you said, producers. I mean, uh, the, the rest of the country outnumbers farmers. Uh, the rest of the country outnumbers oil workers. And yet the work that they do feed us and they power our cars and everything you know, it's just like you said, producing states versus non-producing states. It's a complicated issue. Uh, I want to move on. Joshua has a question. He says, uh, what is he going to do to avoid yet another illegal war in the name of big oil? What is he doing to work towards ending the other illegal wars we've been involved with since 2003? Does he understand how a declaration of war works? Who is charged with declaring war? So I guess four questions there. I'm assuming his first one is referencing what's going on with Iran. So maybe uh, the, the first question is, what is he going to do to avoid yet another illegal war in the name of big oil? What's your view on the situation with Iran? Well, I, I disagree with the, uh, the pre, I mean, the, co- the, the pretext of that conversation. Yeah. I mean, when we have intelligence saying that Iran is going to use proxy, I mean, and it seems like it's credible intelligence that are, they're going to use some proxy, proxy assets to target American soldiers. That's, that's not a fight about big oil. That is a fight about Iran as one of the, is the largest state sponsor of terror in the entire world. And that's a serious issue. Now, I've said this before, and I'll continue to say this, that one of the biggest problems in Congress is we abdicate our responsibility on these issues. I, I always say, Madison, when they, when he was talking about Article One in the Congress and, and the legislative branch, he always said they will fight tooth and nail to protect their legislative authority. I think the one thing that Madison probably got wrong in that conversation is that for the most part, the legislative branch will fight tooth and nail to, main, to maintain their membership in the legislative branch. And if abdicating your responsibility makes it more likely for you to get reelected, we've been I think Congress has been way too comfortable doing that. We've had this conversation about emergency orders. We've had that conversation. I think you could talk about it, about a lot of our armed conflicts across the country or across the world. Um, we need to do a better job of bringing that back. The problem, just the reality of that is the problem is that takes really, truly bipartisan, bicameral support. And I'm not sure this town's ready for that right now. His uh, his other question was, I mean, obviously he was talking about Iran, but he's also talking about working towards ending the other illegal wars we've been involved with. Now, setting aside his opinion that they're illegal wars, obviously talking about, I'm assuming, Iraq, Afghanistan. Your thoughts on that? Because we still have troops there. Your thoughts on that situation? Yeah, I mean, there's two sides to that. One, we need we need to we need to engage them there so we don't engage them at home. But also, I think actually President Trump um, is more interested in solving these things in in a and having drawdowns and not being involved in these endless forever conflicts. And I think that's the right approach. We we too often go into these things with no real defined metrics. And it's been very different since September 11th. I mean, the, the entire world changed when when your conflicts were with organizations and not um, <laughs> countries with uniforms and military. But we still have I mean, we can't we can't be continually involved in these things forever. We have to do a better job of getting there, dealing with what we're dealing with and getting out. Kelly, thanks for your time. Thanks, Rob. That's it for today's podcast. Remember, new episodes come out most weekday mornings. If you're listening to this show on a platform that allows you to rate or review the podcast, if you would leave an honest rating or an honest review, I would sure appreciate it. Each new rating or review uh, helps other people find the podcast, so it's a really good way to help expand my audience. So if you would do that for me, I'd appreciate it. If you ever have any feedback on the show, email me, Rob, at SayAnythingBlog.com. Follow me on social media. Uh, you can find me. Just search for Rob Porter, Say Anything Blog, or Facebook or Twitter. Pretty easy to find. Uh, if you follow me, say hi, because I like it when people say hi. And thanks for listening. I appreciate it. We'll talk again. <laughs>